Okay, so let's dig in this morning to, let's go straight to our scripture. And they're going to flash that on the screen here. I'm going to read this through and, and think about it as, I, I know this might be familiar to many of you, but think about if you've seen anything new sort of bubbled to the top as you think about, especially as you think about our world today, the, the setting in which we live these days. So this is from the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, not in, the, in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, "Let me take the speck out of your eye," while the log is in your own eye, Jason? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. You know, it's really interesting. Often we tend to go to a very spiritual place with this. We tend to internalize it and think, oh, this is just work that I'm doing by myself. But uh, it's also interesting to note that this is one of Jesus's great stand-up comedy routines when he's using this idea of a speck and a log sticking out of uh, our own eye as we're trying to get a speck out of someone else's eye. So, I want, to, I want you to hang with me for a second, and I want you to think about what it is to judge someone. A couple of days ago, my family and I, we were enjoying some, some swimming time, and we were, here we were throwing ourselves into the water, and we were doing some fun flips and dives and trying to do it as good as possible. None of us are expert divers by any means. Uh, and someone had this idea. They said, hey, you know what? We should be like Olympic judges, and let's go ahead and give scores for everybody. And it was all in good fun, and it, and it all went well, until the judge from Maryland, who shall, rename, who shall remain nameless, Peggy, till the judge from Maryland had the nerve to give me a two on my front flip just because I landed on my rear. Well, it was water, so it was okay. I think it deserved at least a three. That's not the kind of judging that we're talking about today. We are talking about the difference between what it is to use good judgment and what it is to be judgmental. Think about it this way. Every day, every hour, we have to make judgments about what is right and what is wrong. We have to make judgments about who to trust and who not to trust with our lives with our children, with our money, even with our faith. What source do I go to when it comes to COVID precautions? Do I send my kids back to school? Do I attend that event? Which politician do I think is really telling me the truth? Which institution has my best interests at heart. Even listening to this and participating in this worship service and listening to preachers like me, you should practice good judgment. Is Pastor Greg leading me down the right path? Or maybe down a wrong path? You have to make that judgment. We need to make judgments all the time. We need to make good judgments so that we can be safe, so that we can protect our loved ones and communities, and so that we can live well. Now, it's fair to note that Jesus made a lot of good judgments himself. He made a lot of judgments about what was going on around him in the world. So, think about it. He was always making judgments about uh, Roman imperial rule, which was unjust, and he made it known that it was unjust. That was a judgment. He was using discernment to decide and tell people what was just. That was a judgment. He was also not pulling any punches when it came to talking about his own religious leaders and the fact that they were really long on talk and really short on action. Another good judgment. He even makes judgment, judgments in the stories he tells, like the one we saw today or like the wise man. He built his house upon the sand, and what happened? The house got washed away. We need to practice good judgment. 
But here's the thing, and here's what I want you to remember, because I think a lot of times we get stuck in this place. When we hear do not judge, we think, oh, I can't make good judgments. I can't practice discernment. But there is a difference between exercising our good judgment and judging other people, okay? So this is perhaps the important distinction for today. And additionally, to make it even harder, sometimes these days, I think in particular, we have this other question. How can I take a principled stand for something that I believe in and that I'm confident is right while at the same time not judging other people. That's really tricky terrain sometimes. So I want you to think about that as I continue. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Scripture. Feel free. I, I love it when you put stuff in the chat. I know that sometimes you want to listen, and I appreciate that too. But if, you've, if you'd like, feel free to add things to the chat. And we're going to have talk back afterwards, so maybe we can get to some of that, and we'll be able to share some of the wisdom that you have. So, as I dug into the Scripture, here are some things I wanted to know. I thought, well, because of this issue of good judgment being different from judgmentalism, what does this word judge really mean? How did Jesus mean it? Can we get any insight into that? So, I went back and I studied the Greek. That was the language that the New Testament was, was written in. Matthew, the writer of this gospel, put it in Greek, started with it in Greek. And what I found was that the word judge in Greek is very similar to the word judge in English in the sense that it can mean many things. You can be an Olympic judge and give scores. You can be a judge in a court of law. You can practice good judgment, and you can be judgmental. That's what I learned in Greek. So, all right, maybe it didn't clear things up a lot there, but a little further study showed me that Jesus is clearly talking and urging his listeners not to be judgmental of others. Okay, full confession time. I've been watching a lot of NBA basketball recently. I felt deprived all uh, winter and spring not being able to uh, watch the NBA playoffs. And here we are, full, sp- full swing. And I sit there and I yell at the, even though my beloved Phoenix Suns are out of the playoffs, didn't make it, I will sit there and yell at the TV over and over again, come on, ref, how did you not see that? Put your glasses on. Oh my goodness, that is such a travel. Whoa, this guy is a terrible passer. When is he going to learn how to pass? The coach needs to get him out of there. My judgments can go on without end for all two hours of a basketball game. And don't get me started on Damian Lillard. The guy is so good, he basically knocked my again, beloved sons, right out of the playoffs. And so I'm trying really hard not to be judgmental, even of someone so skilled. I joke, of course, but we all know that that's where judgment can start. Then, of course, it can run much deeper. So I had two weeks to prepare for this sermon. We knew what it would be. We got this sermon on demand, and it was from a young adult. And so I really wanted to to give it extra attention because I know that this young adult really was curious. What do we do, especially, I think, in a world of social media where judgments can come really fast and where we're living our lives in a much more public way a lot of times, and so we open ourselves up to judgment a lot. And so as I thought about it, I realized just how good I am at judging other people. But I know that I'm not alone. So I'm going to share a couple of statements. And I want you to just in your own head, think about if you have any similar thoughts, any thoughts akin to what I struggle with. Here's here's some of those thoughts. I think things like, why in the world Does he do it this way? Does he do it that way? When there's clearly a better way to do it. How about this one? Why does she care so much about that? It's not that important. But then 30 minutes later, I'll say, why doesn't he care about that? It's so important. How about this one? Why don't they work harder, smarter, faster, better? Why can't they just be better? Why can't they just do better? And then you sprinkle in some social media on top of all this. Now, social media, I don't want to dogpile on social media. 
Social media has certainly not invented the fine art of judgment. We know that it was clearly going on, going on as far back as Jesus' day. But I think what it does is it magnifies it because we know what everybody's thinking all the time now. So, maybe you connected with some of those ways of judging other people. We've all been well instructed on how to judge others. But here's the deal. I wanted to, maybe, maybe if those didn't connect for you and you wanted some tips on how to better judge people, you know, how you can do this, I got, I, I got a fun little thing here to do. I, I brought it, I don't know if, you, if, if this is showing up on the camera. I'm going to switch over here now, Kirk. So here's some tips from little Greg, the, the worst Greg that can be on how to really judge other people. And you'll remember this because it's got this really neat acronym. I'm not going to spill the acronym, but so here's what you do. If you really want to judge somebody, here's what you do. First, we're going to start with a D. You decide. You decide their intent. So this doesn't require talking to them, actually. You know, this, this is just, you can just decide their intent because after all, you're a really smart person, right? So you can decide their intent. Don't bother going to ask them about it. Don't bother getting uh, clarification from them. So you want to decide their intent. And then you want to, this is, this is our next one. You want to recognize that there's only, whoops, that's an N. There's only one way to see things. Okay? There's only one way to see things. And as, as you all know, as we all know, we're usually the best at deciding what that one way is, right? Okay, so, so there we go. We've got the D and the O. And then we're going to go to the P and we're going to presume. We're going to presume that even if we were to draw this to their attention, they wouldn't see it, that they're going to push back, that they're going to disagree with us, no matter how wrong they are, Right? They're going to disagree with it. And so, but we can presume that. We just, we just know that, right? Because we know how they are, right? We know how they are, okay? And the next is we're going to recognize that we are exceptional. Like we're the best, right? Like we, the, clearly this has spelled it out, that we already know how to decide. We already know what the one way to view it is. We can already presume what's going on in their heads. And, and of course, we're exceptional, right? So there you are, D-O-P-E. That's the way. That's the way to judge other people. So just in case, maybe so you know what to avoid. I, th I think we'll put it in that context, right? Okay, so, so there's that. I thought it'd be helpful to write it up there just in case. Uh, maybe you want to take notes at home if, if this is something that you want to hone in on, if you want to get better at it. Of course, I'm joking here, but it gets to the point that Jesus was pointing to, which is it's all super self-centered. I have all of the answers. I know what you're thinking or what they are thinking and even why you or they are thinking that way. I have it all figured out. Here's the thing though. Our judgment says a lot more about us than it does about them. Well, you may have noticed where Jesus went in the scripture after he said to not judge. Can we flash that back on the screen, Kirk? That'd be great. Thank you. And I'll just pick up when we're thinking in that self centered way. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So, in a very pragmatic way, Jesus is saying, get yourself straightened out. Get yourself straightened out before you go to your neighbor. It's interesting that Jesus presumes even that we're going to fall into this trap of judging others. And I don't know about you, but that allows some glimmer of hope for me that Jesus is going to presume that I'm going to fall into it, that it's that big a temptation, that it's that much a part of how we as humans just sort of want to operate. So 
I'm going to fall into it. But when I fall into it, how can I dig myself out? And Jesus says, the first thing I need to do is start looking inwardly. What's going on with me? Because before I can offer any correction to my brother or sister, I have to start here. It also reminds me of that saying that says something along the lines of, what bothers us most in other people are the things that we don't like about ourselves. What bothers us most about other people are the things, those parts of ourselves that bother us too. Sometimes we're blind to them, sometimes we know them, but we need to start here. So I went on. I, can, I continued to study this scripture, and I realized that Jesus is talking about a lot more than just those petty judgments in life, screaming at the TV and the refs during an NBA game. He was talking about, like, big-time judgment as well, big-time condemnation. I was reading one scholar who said that we could probably even translate this in a more accurate way by replacing judge with condemn to hell. Do not condemn to hell those around you, because what? You too will be condemned to hell. The judgment that you put out is going to come back boomerang-like on you. And now as big and heavy as that sounds, and I know none of us would ever use that kind of language, but we do that. We do that. We just use different words. We say things like, oh, I'm done with her. Never again. Never again. Or he's canceled. He's done. I'm erasing him from my life. What a waste of space. We can get pretty ugly. And basically, we are saying that we are erasing that this person even exists. Hmm. On the contrary, what does Jesus say time and time again? Don't write people off entirely. Don't claim that someone is beyond redemption. How can you dare think that somebody is beyond God's grace? Because here's the thing, when we do that, we get perilously close to playing God ourselves, right? When we start defining who is worthy of even existing, who is worth God's love or not? Think about it this way. If we, can, if we all condemn one another to the fires of hell, who's going to be left to put out the flames? Again, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about abandoning our principles And I want to be super clear, I'm especially not talking about those who are suffering abuse or mistreatment at the hands of others, neglect. No, we're not talking about that. But what I am talking about is let's not confuse judgmentalism with practicing good judgment. Jesus wants us to practice good judgment. Just 10 verses later in the same speech, it's a Sermon on the Mount. Jesus points to the necessity of good judgment when he warns us about false prophets about those who want to manipulate us for their own gain. So, of course, we must use our own God-given wits and intuition to find the right way and the wrong way in life. Even further in Matthew, Jesus instructs us on how we ought to confront a member of our community if we perceive an error in their ways, or how we should be confronted if there is an error in our ways. That's Matthew 18. Jesus absolutely wants us to practice good judgment and to help one another in life, especially our sisters and brothers in faith. So, let's bring it around the corner to the end, because that leads us back to what I think is really sort of the million-dollar question today. How can I take a principled stand on something without being judgmental of others? Because that's so often the way it's couched, right? If I say that racism is wrong, if I say that racism is a sin, 
well, then people automatically assume that that puts someone, by whatever their definition is, of, of a racist in the category of does not exist, never will exist, and is bound to the fires of hell. Well, who am I to say that? It's wrong. But how am I going to work with that person? I'm going to get to that in a minute. How do we take a stand while still having grace with one another? And this is where, for me, it's really helpful to realize that this is not an impossible task. It's a very difficult task, but it's not an impossible task. And it's been done time and again, and not only by Jesus. It's the Nelson Mandela's of the world, the John Lewis's of the world, the Malala's of the world. People, think about them. People who have take, taken principled stands and pivoted entire nations to right causes while at the same time extending unbelievable grace to those who would beat them down, quite literally. Taking a principled stand can work hand in hand with extending grace. Both can happen at the same time. Okay, so how do we do it? All right, we, I'm going to pivot back over here. Let's not be dopes. We can, we can do better. Here's, here's what I really want you to remember for today, all sarcasm aside. The first starts with an H. And it's hope. How do we have hope for what we will see next? That will be the acronym of the day. And the first H is humility. We have to recognize that as we talk to somebody else, as we try to improve somebody else, there may be a plank in our own eye or a log in our own eye. Humility is the first H. Next, O. We need to own the fact that there may be more than one way. There may be more than one way to see something. And this goes hand in hand with humility, of course. If we own that there may be more than one way, we recognize that we may not have the absolute corner of the market on perspective. Okay, so what's the P? And this, is, this gets hard. Presume that we have some things in common. Presume that they're coming from a good place, that they're coming from a place that makes sense to them at least, and that they're not evil to the core. The word evil gets thrown around a lot these days. We need to be much more careful about how we use it. Okay, and the next, maybe you can even guess it. I've said it a couple times. Extend grace. How can we extend grace to one another, even with the hope that that grace will be extended to us? Wouldn't that be amazing? So, here we are. Hope. From dope to hope. Humility. Own that there may be more than one way. Presume that another person's intent comes from a good place and extend grace. If we can do these things, and they're not easy, if we can do these things, then we have created the ground by which we can still take a principled stand. None of these in this HOPE acronym, are saying that we need to give up who we are, what's right, what we believe is right, but they're creating a way of thinking and a way of being that creates an opportunity for God to work. Because when we write somebody off, condemn them to hell, when we write them off entirely as hopelessly wrong, as ignorant, as pig-headed, as mean or dumb or lazy, how much room have we just left for transformation? For them or for us? You know, 
Oftentimes we take the scriptures and we want to, I would say, over-spiritualize them. And by that I mean that we want to take them in and we want to put them into ourselves and we want to be these very holy people. And that's good, but I think sometimes we miss the fact that Jesus gives us these teachings, not because it's just going to improve us, but because it's going to improve our world. And so, do not judge others is not just something for me to ingest and work on. It becomes a way of being. And so, if that becomes a way of being for me, then I've just opened the door to change others around me and for them to change me for the better as well. Because will judging, help, helping, will judging them help them? No, it won't. Will judging improve our relationship? Absolutely not. Will judging create a deeper understanding between us? Of course not. Does judging reflect the way that we understand God works with us individually, let alone communally? It has no place. So, if you want to contextualize it, and I know this will contextualize it in a very crystal clear way, I want you to think about this. On that Wednesday after the election in November, no matter who wins the election, will our country, will our grand community of the United States of America be better off if we've written one another off as hopeless, as pig-headed, as ignorant, as dumb, as wrong? Or will we be better off? Will we, will we be more Christ-like if we open the door to staying connected and we create an opportunity for God to work within us? You know the answer. It's clear. I'm going to leave you on a little bit of a cliffhanger here. I promised, well, I mean, I didn't promise. The, 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 the Sermon on Demand came across as, what do we do when other people judge us? Well, we're running against time. And so in our sermon talk back, I'm going to invite Pastor Pam up, and she's going to share some thoughts on that. We're going to share in our talk back together how we might respond when people judge us. Not only how do we avoid judging others, but what do we do when people judge us? I hope you'll stick around for that. It's coming up in just a few moments. God be with you. God be with me. God be with us as we try to walk Jesus' way of love and non-judgmental inclusion.